Reddit store. Good. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here uh, today, um, and welcome to this session. Um, we have a lot of material to go through, um, and we ha only have 90 minutes. Uh, and this is the reason why I'm not going to have any hands-on uh, exercises during this session. But you are going to have, uh, and you're going to get a lot of information, a lot of details, uh, a lot of background that you can take with you home um, and work with it. Um, uh, I'm open for questions uh, during the session. So please do not hesitate to ask if you have any questions. Although, if you have a very special question to a very special problem you have in your system, I would appreciate if we can talk about that after the session. Um, so, I need some information from you to know how this session is gonna, is gonna be. Um, how many of you know how, uh, what an ELK system is and how you can use it? Good. Um, do you have an ELK system already working? Good. Are you planning to, to install an ELK system in the future? Good. Um, how many metrics or logs are you uh, receiving in your ELK system per second? Um, up to uh, 5,000 a second? 10,000? 30? More than 50? Okay, good. Um, the way I'm going to, to organize this session is uh, I'm going to have a short introduction with some background uh, information that we need to, to, uh, to take the right decisions when we are working with an ARC system. And then we will go to the technical part when, where, where I'm going to uh, show you how to build up uh, a system that uh, is reliable uh, and can scale and that uh, will uh, survive problems. Uh, in, in the components uh, of the system. Uh, my name is Rafael. I work at the University of Oslo. Um, the University of Oslo is the main university uh, in Norway. Uh, we have around uh, 30,000 students, 6,000 employees, um, more than around 14, 15,000 um, PCs and laptops clients, and uh, three, 4,000 servers. So, so we have a lot of devices sending data to our system. But let's start. If you're working with, uh, uh, with security, uh, you need access to information. That's, uh, that's uh, a key thing uh, to, to find out what is happening in your system and to, to, to be able to react when th things happen in your system. Because you won't be able to have a 100% uh, secure system, uh, but if you have access to the right data, uh, you will be able to find out when things uh, are happening and, and you will be able to react. Uh, we have already tons of information uh, in our logs all over the, in the, the infrastructure. Uh, you have logs from operative, uh, operative systems, applications, networks, services. Um, the information is already there, but you need a system uh, that will be able to collect all this data to organize this in the right way um, so you can access this data uh, later on. Uh, and you need this data, as I say, to take the right decisions uh, based in, in what is happening in, in your infrastructure. And this is where ELK uh, can help us. Um, uh, in the moment you start collecting data, uh, you will uh, um, generate a huge amount, I mean, uh, the, a huge amount of, of um, uh, of data coming into your system. Um, probably much more than you think, uh, at least that's what happened with us. Um, and then you have to start considering some aspects uh, that will impact how you can collect that data, how you can process that data, transform it and, and make it available for, for your users. Uh, one of the first things you have to consider when you are um, collecting this amount of data is uh, are there any laws there that will um, constrain what you can do with it? Um, privacy, uh, laws, as, as, as I say. Um, you will 
have access not only to what is happening in your infrastructure, but you will have access to personal data, what uh, your users are doing, how uh, they are using your, your, your system, uh, and then you have to, to take care of that. Um, in Europe, for example, we have the uh, GDPR uh, uh, regulation uh, that uh, decides uh, how we can work with these kind of systems. Um, we have great presentations during this conference about the, the subject, so um, yeah, um, it's good if you can see one of, one of some of the, of the um, uh, presentations out there. Uh, you will be collecting data uh, from multiple uh, sources, a lot of different uh, applications. You will have a lot of uh, multiple user groups sending data to your, to your, um, to your system. Uh, not everybody will have the right access to all the data in your system. So you have to think how you are, uh, are, you are going to organize this, uh, especially uh, thinking in the laws. Uh, um, that define how you can use that data and how you can secure that data. Um, some of the data you collected will be owned from, from, um, by different user groups, so you have, to, you have to think about that too. Of course, you will have to way of authenticating the, the users in your, in your uh, system to, have, um, uh, to define the right access. Um, and a way at, um, of defining how a user group, uh, what a user group can access uh, uh, in your system. How long are you going to save the data you are collecting? Um, are you going to, use the, to, to, to save it uh, for days, uh, weeks? We have by law in, in Norway, we have to keep some of the logs for three and six months, some of them more. So this will have a huge impact in the part of the system that you will use for storage. Um, are you collecting, receiving data from just a few uh, devices or for thousands of, from thousands of, the, of devices? This will have a huge impact in the part of the system uh, that is uh, receiving the, the data. Um, do you have a few uh, devices delivering huge amounts of, of data compared to the rest? Uh, this in, it will impact uh, uh, the resources needed uh, to process uh, the data coming from these uh, devices. You can have a system with hundreds of, of servers, uh, but if they don't have enough capacity to process the, the few devices that are delivering a lot of data, you will have a problem. And of course, um, everything gets much more complicated when the amount of data uh, grows, um, when you have to have a system working 24 seven, and that will happen. When you start using it, you will start getting more and more um, information out of the system that will help you to administrate your infrastructure. And uh, maybe in the beginning you don't need that 24 seven, but very soon you will find out that you need that system to do your work. And you want a resilient uh, um, uh, system that will um, adapt itself to special problems, special situations. Um, you will have moments where you are receiving much more uh, logs than uh, you normally do. Uh, parts of the, uh, of the system that uh, have problems that stop working. So you have a, a, a you need a system that will cope uh, with that. And of course, you want that everything to 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 work fast. You know, do um, you want a short time from a log or an event is uh, created in your infrastructure until it's processed, safe, and available for you? So we have two solutions. Uh, when you want to um, install uh, an ELK system. One of the solutions out there is the one uh, delivered by, by Elastic. They are the one that created uh, the, uh, the ELK uh, stack. Uh, they have an open source base code plus uh, um, extra package uh, that will, they will implement the extra functionality uh, um, depending of, on how much you pay them. Um, we have tried several times to, 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 to pay uh, for that extra package to get uh, some of the function functionality that available there, uh, but we have not been able to, to get a, an agreement with them because it's so expensive that we don't have the money to pay for that. 
uh, some, some of the functionality we needed, uh, uh, we have to implement it ourselves, and I'm going to show you uh, some of that, uh, some, some of the functionality we, we have uh, done so ourselves. Uh, but you have another uh, uh, distribution now that um, is not, I mean, it came la last year, if I remember properly. It calls Open Distro, it's from Amazon Netflix, and the, what they use is the open source base from Elastic, and they have built some plugins on top of that for Elastic <coughs> and Kibana uh, that will uh, help you, especially uh, the part for authentication and uh, authorization. Uh, it, it works, uh, it looks uh, really nice. So we are going to test it just to see how, how it works and maybe uh, start using that uh, distribution. Well, the idea is very simple. You have an amount of uh, data uh, out there. You want to send it to a central uh, system that will receive that information, that will process that information, that, and that will save that information for, for, um, uh, for you to use it. Uh, we will have uh, uh, agents, normally agents, uh, collecting that data locally in your devices and sending it to, to the central uh, system. We'll, we'll, we'll use Logstash as the main component for receiving data and for processing and, and uh, manipulating that data. And we'll use Elasticsearch to, uh, to save uh, that data. Um, we have different method, methods to, to, to send data to the central system, but the most common are agents. And the agents uh, that you have uh, from Elastic are really nice. Uh, they call it uh, bit agents. They have several different uh, uh, types uh, that you can use to send different um, types of, uh, of um, information to your system. Um, they are very stable. They use a few resources. Um, and we are going to use the file bit uh, agent in your, in your, in your session just uh, as an example of how we can start sending data to, to the central system. Uh, file bit has a very uh, simple com uh, configuration. Um, the main configuration file is usually on, uh, under the etc uh, file bit uh, directory. Um, you have different sections, but the most important are the one for input modules and output. In the input uh, section, you will, you will have to, to, to define a few parameters to say where you can find all these inputs that will start sending data uh, to, the, to the central uh, um, uh, system, uh, and how often you will check that if new uh, inputs have been de um, defined there, and so on. Uh, then you have the modules that uh, um, is, it, it works almost the same as inputs, but uh, it has a little more uh, um, functionality, and they are the modules that already are coming with the system, so you don't have to build yourself. So. And the output uh, uh, is where you define where you are going to send uh, your, your logs, uh, and you can define some parameters to, to encrypt the, the, uh, the traffic and to verify how um, these certificates you use uh, if they are uh, proper certificates or not, or whatever. And then you have the part uh, where you configure the input. Um, um, this is the part where we define, for example, um, uh, the log file we are going to send to our ELK system. You, the, you do it in the path uh, section of the, of the, of the um, configuration file. And we use the part with fields. Uh, we use it very, uh, a lot, just, uh, to define some metadata that will help us to organize that information in our ELK system. So we have three fields that are very important for us. We have the log owner. There we will define who owns the data you are sending in uh, or who will have access to that data when the data is received in, in, in the ELK system. We have the application where we define the, the, the source of the data we are sending in. And we have the data processor uh, that will define which part of the ELK system will process that uh, information you are sending. Uh, and of course, uh, one thing I have to say about the agents, you will, you will need a, a configuration manager. It, it really depends of your infrastructure, but you will need a configuration manager to automate uh, the whole process of uh, 
uh, installing of all these agents in your devices, in your service clients, and, and to configure it and to have control what is happening there. So um, because usually you have so many uh, devices sending data to your, to your system that you have to automate. You cannot do that uh, manually. Well, as you know, the most important thing um, to be able to scale our system um, and to process huge amounts of data is to have uh, parallel processing. Um, with parallel processing, you will be able to split the flow of data coming into your system. Um, and this technique is the, the, the technique we are going to use heavily uh, from now on to scale our system and be able to process um, huge amounts of data. One of the main parts of the tutorial is the part uh, where we talk about the receiver and the processing part. Um, the main component in this part is Logstash. Um, and we will uh, use HA proxy and Rabbit, RabbitMQ um, to put together uh, a system uh, um, that can um, um, scale uh, in the way we want. We will start with some information about Logstash. Um, the main configuration um, uh, in a Logstash uh, instance is very simple. You have three blocks in your configuration file. You have the input block uh, where you define how you are going to receive data into your system. You have the filter block where you are going to uh, define or manipulate that data coming in, and you have the output block where you define how you are going to send that data uh, further in the system. We have a really nice uh, um, functionality in, in uh, Logstash called uh, pipelines, and we use this measure to implement the first level of uh, parallel processing in, in, in our system. Um, it's using, um, we use pipelines to split the flow of data coming into, the, uh, into your, our system. Uh, and um, the good thing with the pipelines is that you can have, uh, they can have their own uh, configuration files. So you don't have to have, you know, there are uh, configuration files per uh, pipeline. So it will be very easy to maintain these configuration files. Um, the way you implement uh, pipelines in Logstash is by defining a pipeline uh, configuration file under etc logstash. Uh, there you will have, uh, you will define all the pipelines in your in, um, uh, instance. And what you have to define there, there is the, the ID of the pipeline, the name of the pipeline. You have to define where um, uh, the configuration for that pipeline is. Uh, and it's nice to define uh, the, the number of workers uh, a pipeline will use. Uh, and the number, uh, the batch size that that pipeline will use. I'm going to talk about, a little about that um, now. The pipeline workers, um, that's the next uh, level of parallel processing you can have uh, in your system. Uh, when the data come into the pipeline through the, log, uh, the input block, uh, all the data coming uh, into uh, that block will be saved in an internal log stash queue. And then you can have uh, multiple workers that will connect to that queue, uh, will uh, get out some data, and uh, it will, they will um, um, run the filter block and the output block uh, in parallel. And this usually works really good because the, the, the pipeline will use most of the time in the filter part um, of the pipeline. Um, It's really important to monitor that, uh, that queue uh, to find out how many workers you should have in a pipeline. Uh, if the queue has a lot of data and it doesn't go down, uh, the, the, the amount of data there doesn't go down, that uh, can mean that you don't have enough workers to process all the data coming in in your pipeline. Um, so that's a way of knowing how many workers a pipeline should have. If the, the, if the queue is almost empty, or empty or almost empty, uh, then you have enough workers to, to, do, uh, to do the work. 
So now it's time to start um, implementing our system. Um, we will start with a very basic uh, configuration. Uh, we have a file bit agent sending data to the a log stash instance with one pipeline. Um, and we will send the data uh, further to our Elasticsearch uh, cluster. To implement that, the only thing you need is to very simple uh, log stash um, uh, configuration file um, that will have an input block with uh, a bit, uh, a bit um, um, plugin. So you can send data from your bits agent. Um, then you need a filter block where you will do something with the data coming in, depending on what kind of application it is, that that application uh, information, it's already defined in the agent. And then you have the output block that will send uh, the, that, the data coming out of the filter block uh, to our Elasticsearch um, uh, cluster. Um, we define the index name. Uh, in the index name, we will have information about the log owner, the, the, who owns the, the data, the type of application uh, um, and data we have in that index, and we will have some uh, year and week um, uh, information to know when the, the index uh, uh, was created. So, it was as easy as that. Um, some problems with this implementation. Uh, well, um, the configuration file, if you have a lot of uh, log owners, a lot of uh, groups sending data to the, to the system or many applications, the configuration file can get huge. It will be very difficult to maintain uh, and, uh, and, and very difficult to, to split in different pipelines. Um, you have only one pipeline, so you cannot run things in parallel, very difficult to, to scale. Uh, what we did in, be in the beginning, uh, some years ago when we started using this, is okay, we, we will have uh, several um, uh, pipelines per user group sending data in. But then if they wanted to send the same type of data, uh, for example, through num uh, bits uh, um, agents, we will have to have uh, all these pipelines working in different ports, so then uh, we have to maintain um, many different uh, configuration files for all the different agents depending of who was sending data in. So it was very uh, difficult to maintain and, and difficult to, to scale. So what we found out is that splitting uh, the receiver part and the processor part, part in, in Logstash uh, helped us a lot and gave us the opportunity to um, scale because we could uh, run uh, several pipelines in, in parallel. Um, we could have a common receiver part for, uh, for all the user groups and all the applications out there. Um, and um, we could increase the parallel processing uh, very easy. Um, and when we split this, uh, what we, we, we need something between the receiver and the processor part of the, of the system. So we started using RabbitMQ as a message broker for sending data uh, between the receiver and, and, and the processor. In RabbitMQ, what we do is that we create one queue per uh, processor pipeline. Uh, RabbitMQ has very different ways of routing data uh, internally but uh, we try to do it as simple as possible. So what we did, or what we do, uh, is we use what they call a direct uh, exchange uh, that will receive uh, all the data coming in, and depending on a uh, uh, routing key that you are defining in the metadata of the data coming in, uh, you will route the, the, the data to all the different uh, queues. Uh, so you will have all the log stash output uh, uh, blocks for your logs receivers sending data to the exchange, and you will have all the log stash inputs uh, blocks from your log stash processor uh, getting data from their queue in RabbitMQ. So now what we have to do, um, um, we have to define how the pipeline, the log stash receiver, 
uh, is going to work. So uh, it will look something like this. Uh, we will uh, continue using the input block with our beat, uh, with our beat uh, plugin. Uh, the only thing we have um, done now compared to the first uh, configuration file is that we have defined a couple of uh, metadata fields that will give, you, give us some information on the type of pipeline we are using and the Logstash receiver that, that uh, uh, is processing the data coming through, through this uh, pipeline. Um, and we need this because when, when we start scaling, we will have several um, um, servers and it's nice to know where the data have been uh, in, in your system. In the filter block, what we will do is to define the key you will use internally in RabbitMQ to route the, uh, the data to the, to the right uh, queue in, in RabbitMQ based on the data processor field that we define it in the, in the agents. Um, and then the output uh, will use the RabbitMQ plugin in Logstash to send that data to uh, our RabbitMQ server. Using the key you have defined, uh, you have defined uh, in the filter block. And then uh, the Logstash processor would look something like that. Uh, we are going to, um, to um, connect to the RabbitMQ server. We are going to connect to our uh, own, um, our own uh, queue, the queue for that pipe processor pipeline. Uh, um, we are going to get the information out of, the, uh, of there, and then in the filter block, we will process and manipulate that information based, for example, in, uh, in the application uh, in the application um, um, field that we also define in the agent, in the source of the, of the data. And the output, the output will be a, a, as we had in, in the beginning. We will send all our information to our um, Elasticsearch server. Uh, again, with the log owner name uh, as a prefix, the application, depending on the application, it's coming uh, in, in, the, in the pipeline and the year and the week. So now we have all the functionality we need. We have the receiver and the processors, processor uh, instances. We have the possibility of, of splitting out uh, the data flow in multiple uh, pipelines. Uh, it's easy to maintain because uh, every pipeline has its, its own configuration. Um, but we have many single point of, uh, of failure. So we need to do that, we need to do something with that um, um, to implement high availability and, and to have more parallel processing. Uh, so, and that's what we are going to do. We are going to, to start um, um, scaling the, the system. The first thing we are going to do is we, we are going to start working with the Logstash receivers. Um, what we want there is we want to have more instances so we can run things in parallel and we can have um, um, redundancy um, in case one of the servers goes down or we have to run maintenance. Um, yeah. So that's the first thing we have to do. We have to install uh, new servers uh, that will run Logstash receiver pipelines. It is really important that all the server has the same uh, configuration file, so they will work exactly the same. And then what we, we will um, do is to have uh, HA proxy in front uh, to, to do some load balancing and to route the traffic uh, to the available Logstash receiver service uh, behind. Uh, the Logstash configuration for the receivers um, is the same as we already have. We don't have to do anything with it. Uh, we have the input with the beat uh, plugin, the only uh, adjustment we have uh, done there is uh, to define the right uh, name of the server running this instance. And that's because you will have several servers and you want to know where the data was uh, when it came into your, your system. Um, you have the filter uh, part that it will be exactly the same as when you had only one server. 
and you have the rabbit and queue or the output in the output block that will be exactly the same as you had when you had one service. So you don't have to do anything there. Um, what we have to do is to configure it, uh, SJ proxy in front of this uh, Logstash LF receivers uh, service. What we have done again um, is try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, uh, you can do a lot of things with HTTP proxy, and the possibilities there are uh, a lot of possibilities. You can do uh, uh, whatever you want, uh, but you have to keep it simple. Uh, um, so what we did, uh, uh, or what we do, is uh, we have installed uh, HTTP proxy as a middle proxy in a load balancing topology, and we uh, run uh, SSL termination in the HTTP proxy. Yes? Yes, well, Why did you go we did. Um, uh, the first, uh, the main reason was because um, if we have to, uh, if we have to change the topology or the number of servers uh, receiving data, then we will have to update all the. Yeah, do you have? Yeah, do you have that? Uh, uh, for example, in Linux. We have Linux, we have Windows, several uh, uh, different types of Windows, we have Mac. In Linux, it works really good. Linux, we can change the, the whole configuration of thousands of servers and, and, and clients in, you know, in just a minute. Uh, but for example, in Windows, it's, it doesn't work as fast. Um, the implementation we have on the configuration management we have, for example, in Windows, is not as effective as the one we have in Linux. And, and it, we will have times where, you know, you have a configuration that doesn't match the configuration in the agents. And, and that's the reason why we wanted to have just one uh, point where you can deliver your, your data. And, you know, and what happens uh, after that, it really doesn't matter for the agents. So, yeah. Um, this topology means that the, the devices delivering data to your uh, system will be talking with the HE proxy, and the HE proxy will be talking with your uh, Logstash receiver servers. We terminate the SSL connection in the HE proxy um, uh, because the last time we tried to run HE proxy in a pass through um, configuration uh, where the SSL connection was terminating, terminated. In the, in the Logstash uh, service, we have um, um, huge problems with uh, the capacity and the resources in the Logstash uh, uh, yeah, service. Um, we needed, I mean, when we were running like this, we, need, uh, we needed a, a huge amount of resources just to handle all these encrypted connections and, and so on. So. Um, it really works really good when we terminate everything in the HE proxy. It doesn't use almost any, any, um, any resources, and we usually have around 15,000 uh, devices connected all the time and delivering data, and you know, um, it, it works really good. So that's the reason why we did the um, SSL float or termination in HE proxy. So what we need is to define a VIP or virtual IP uh, that will be a unique uh, address that we will, uh, and this address will be, the, will be the address we will use all the time to deliver data to our system. So the first thing you have to do is you have to update your DNS uh, with, a new, uh, with a new entry for your Logstash receiver VIP address. Uh, when you have that done, um, we have to configure it, HG proxy. Um, HG proxy has a main configuration file under uh, etc HG proxy uh, directory, and that configuration file has um, four sections. You have the global and default section where you can define several parameters that will uh, uh, configure the behavior of, of your HG proxy, and you have the front end and back end sections where you can define. Uh, uh, new VIP um, addresses in your HA proxy, and you can define all the servers behind uh, VIP address. And that's what, um, 
Yeah, no, before we go. Um, there are two parameters that we, uh, we have changed in that global, uh, global section. And the, one of them is the, the uh, MaxCom, where we define the, the max, um, maximum number of uh, connections we can have uh, open in, your, in our uh, ACA proxy. And then we use that spread uh, checks just to, to have some randomness uh, in how we check, the, we check the servers behind of VAP. Um, that will be very important uh, depending on the, uh, the amount of devices you are going to have. Uh, in, and it's not only the amount of devices you have. We have around 15,000, but if you run, for example, two different v, um, bits agent in one device, you will need two different connections from that device. So um, in this case, if, if we were using two agents per device, we will need uh, around 30,000 uh, connections uh, to the HA proxy. The next thing you have to do is to, uh, to define the front end and the back end for the VIP address uh, of your log stash receiver uh, um, service. Um, you will define the front end uh, with the uh, bind parameter and the address you have defined in, uh, in uh, the IP you have defined in uh, the, your DNS. And in the uh, backend section, you will define all the service behind that VIP uh, address. In this case, we have three servers um, running Logstash as a receiver. Another uh, parameter that is uh, important to, to uh, and you have to think about, uh, is the balance uh, parameter. The balance parameter will define the uh, algorithm um, you use to route uh, traffic to your service. You have different uh, algorithms there. You have the round robin algorithm that will send one connection to each server available, one each time. Uh, but we use the less com, uh, least com um, algorithm that will send all the connections to the server with less um, uh, connections active. And we do this because uh, most of these agents are keeping uh, a long term session uh, that uh, is open for a long time. And if one, you have to take one of the servers down, for, for example, for, uh, uh, for maintenance, when it comes up, uh, the, the load will be unbalanced between all the servers. You will have some servers with all the connections and the new servers just with a few. And it will take a long time until all the servers are balanced in the load they have. So using the less com, uh, you will use much less time um, uh, when a new server comes in into the, the system. Uh, the next thing you have to do is you, uh, we have, uh, as I say, we, US, we, we do SSL termination. So we have to define uh, with the SSL option in the bind in the front end uh, block. We have to define the certificate for your VAP um, uh, address, and you have to, to define the CA, CA file uh, certificate uh, that will define um, what kind of certificates the clients can use to deliver data, and we will verify uh, these uh, certificates, and we will require uh, that all the agents de um, delivering data to our system has a, um, a certificate uh, that is valid. So is this mutual authentication? Yes. The client authenticates the server? Yes. The yes. Uh, and if you, um, one of the parameters, in, for example, in the, in the example with a, a file bit example, in the, in, down there you have all the parameters where you define SSL certificates and all that. Up there you have to, to, to activate that. Um, and the back end uh, block is the same. We have activated uh, SSL. Um, one thing that is important um, is the, that certificate there, uh, HE proxy likes to have, uh, in one file, likes to have the certificate part and the private uh, key part of that certificate. So you will have to concatenate the certificate and the, and the private key in one file for the HE proxy to be uh, happy. 
No, it's not. <laughs> um, the next thing you have to do is you have to modify some kernel uh, parameters in, in Linux. Um, and uh, you can do a lot of things. Um, this is what we use in, in our system, but actually the most important parameters are the one on, on the top. Uh, those parameters will be used when we uh, run HGProxy in a cluster to have redundancy, and they will be used so HProxy can uh, bind to an IP even if the IP is not present or installed in your server. So they are really important uh, parameters you have to activate for HProxy, HAProxy to work in a cluster uh, um, uh, installation. And then you have that one there, the Netcore uh, SOCMAC, um, yeah, SOCMACSOM, that will have to, do, to be the same as the MAXCOM parameter you have defined in your HP, H, HA um, uh, proxy configuration. The rest, um, nice to have, uh, difficult to understand uh, all the time why you need it. Um, not, not that much information out there. Um, why are, you know, but it works good for us. And especially at this part up there with the net filter part, uh, it would be very important to, to do something with uh, if you are running IP tables in your servers to, to control who can uh, access the server. Um, you will need to, to, to do that. So, now we have redundancy and, and, and can scale uh, the logs touch receiver part. If you, if you have more devices and you need, need more resources, you will have just, uh, you just have to, to add uh, several servers there and update your HE proxy uh, with, the, with the new server. That's the only thing you will have to do. Um, next step. We want redundancy also and scale possibilities in the logs touch processor part of the server, uh, of the system. Um, this is actually very uh, easy, um, and we, the only thing we have to do is install new servers, depending on the capacity, I mean, how much uh, capacity you need to process all the data coming in, into your system. Um, the configuration um, of Logstash for these servers uh, doesn't have to, to be updated. You can use the same we had when you, you, you had only one server. So you will have the input block with the RabbitMQ plugin connected to the RabbitMQ uh, server and to the, to the uh, queue for, the, for that pipeline, the same filter um, block, and you will still be connecting to your Elasticsearch uh, um, cluster. The only uh, adjustment uh, uh, we do here is to define the proper name of the server running that instance, because now you will have multiple servers instead of uh, only one. So the, the, the different log stash processes don't fight with each other? No. no so they just pull things on Yes. The uh, it, it really works really good. Yeah. Uh, and you have, and you have, you have uh, I mean, the, the, the RabbitMQ protocol you use to, to connect to, the, to uh, RabbitMQ, it has some uh, acknowledge. It's not that you just pull out all, all, all the things you want. The, the client, in this case, the Logstash processor conf, uh, pipeline is a client, as a, a consumer. It will connect to the RabbitMQ, will say, I want, do you have something for me in, in this queue? And RabbitMQ will say, okay, you have something, you can have it. And then the client will get it, but will have to acknowledge back if, it's, if that transaction was okay or not. And after, I mean, and the, and the, the data will not um, disappear from RabbitMQ until the client or the consumer acknowledge that, okay, that data is now here, I'm, I have it, and, and I can work with it. So it works really good. Does this um, middle, the RabbitMQ as well, for like clustering or anything like that? It's coming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Um, well, so now um, we have this system. We have 
uh, redundancy and, and, and the possibilities of scaling for the receiver part of the, of the system, for the processor part of the system, and we have one single point of failure there, that is the RabbitMQ uh, um, part of the system. Um, in the beginning, uh, we use RabbitMQ has a high availability cluster solution that you can use, and um, that solution will, um, will allow you to create a cluster of RabbitMQ servers that will talk with each other and that we, uh, will uh, replicate uh, the data in all the queues between all the servers, and we were using that for a, for a while. The problem with that solution, the problem we had with that solution was that uh, um, we were using a lot of resources, so our RabbitMQ servers were, um, you know, using all the resources available all the time. Uh, and the other problem we had is that it was very difficult to balance load between these RabbitMQ servers. So if you have to take one of them uh, out of the cluster um, uh, to to do whatever, I mean maintenance or whatever, when the, the, the server came back into the cluster, you know, the load was completely unbalanced. And it was very difficult to, to move the load and to balance them uh, again. So what we did to, to fix uh, this problem was to use HG proxy again in front of RabbitMQ. Um, so what we do, we, what we did with this is uh, we uh, put HGProxy in front of the or RabbitMQ um, servers. So the Logstash receiver pipelines will connect to the RabbitMQ via the HGProxy. Uh, so one Logstash receiver pipeline will be connected to only one RabbitMQ server. And it depends, I mean, it really depends. The HGProxy will, de will, um, uh, will uh, find out which server you should use. So you don't, you don't, define, you don't, you don't, you don't uh, decide that. It's HAProxy that decides to which server you are going to connect. Uh, but it works really good. You know that the, the, you have almost 50-50 connection between the, the servers. We have two RabbitMQ servers, so we have almost 50-50 between the two of them. But the Logstash processors pipelines will be connected to every single RabbitMQ in uh, in the system, and I will show you how you can do that and why. Again, the first thing we have to do, we have to go to our DNS, DNS uh, um, and um, define a new entry from for our RabbitMQ VIP address, the address we are going to use in, in our HA uh, H, H proxy. I need some water. Then we have to define a new front end and uh, back end uh, block in our HA proxy uh, configuration. Um, and, and nothing new here. Uh, we will define the bind, uh, the bind uh, parameter with the, with the IP address for uh, our VIP address, uh, VIP yeah, address. And then in the back end, we will define all the service we're going to have behind that VIP address. Uh, we will continue using the uh, list con um, as uh, the value for the balance uh, parameter, and nothing new. Uh, for the Logstash receiver instances, uh, again, nothing to do. Uh, we already have um, the input block with the beat uh, plugin defined. Uh, we have our filter part that will define the key uh, we are going to use to con when we connect to RabbitMQ. And we have our RabbitMQ plugin in the output block, the same as we have. The only thing we have to take care of is that the host we are, uh, we are connecting to is the VIP address you have defined in your DNS. So it's the only thing you have to take care of. Yes, I think so. I think with the output, it's a little <coughs> bit harder because you have to define like a field or a, a, a key 
within the message to then wrap the output. I don't think there's necessarily a split like algorithm for Fifth. outputting on the logs. Right, right. Yeah, maybe we'll, yeah. maybe we'll pick the, the first one. I, I'm not sure about yeah, that. I think you'd have to maybe yeah. chunk it by yeah. application, which is not really about what you But when we did this, we already had our HA proxy. So it's not that we have to install a new one. So just, you know, just to, to install a new PIP uh, address. So <clears throat> uh, for the Logstash processor, uh, pipeline. There we have to do something because uh, if you remember, as I say, the processor pipeline will be connected to all the RabbitMQ servers in your system. And that's because you don't know where data for, for, for that pipeline will be delivered by the receivers. Um, so the input block uh, will use two RabbitMQ uh, plugins, one connected to the first uh, the first uh, server and the second block connected to the second server. So uh, the filter block will be the same and the output block will be the same. As, as easy as that, your system will look like this. We already have uh, um, uh, uh, redundancy and uh, possibilities of scaling for the receiver part, for the processor part, and for the RabbitMQ uh, part. Um, what we need to do now um, is that we don't have high availability when we are accessing our cl uh, Elasticsearch cluster. And uh, what we want to do is again use a proxy in front of our Elasticsearch uh, cluster. And what we do there uh, is to define uh, new VIP address that will be used to access our Elasticsearch cluster, and we will have all the uh, call Elasticsearch coordinator nodes in our cluster as the servers behind that VIP address. So again, uh, you have to define um, and update your DNS with a new Elasticsearch VIP address. Um, and then we have to define a new front end a new, and a new back end block for that VIP. Uh, we'll do the same as uh, uh, we did with the other uh, VIPs, define bind with the right uh, address, um, and we will define the servers or the coordinator service in our Elasticsearch uh, cluster uh, as the service behind that VIP. The only thing we have uh, done extra here is that block there. And that block there is the way uh, you can define an uh, ACL uh, in, in um, HA proxy, and you will uh, want to protect the access to, uh, to your Elasticsearch as much as possible. So what we have done here is just to define the um, to define to define the um, Logstash processor uh, service because they are the only one that will be accessing our Elasticsearch uh, cluster. All the other servers in, the, in, the, in the, our ELK system, they don't need to talk with Elasticsearch. So we, we, we control uh, that in that way. So now, uh, again, uh, we have a single point of failure here in your system. And that is the HA proxy. Um, so what we want to do is to have some, uh, a way of uh, um, taking away that single point of failure. Um, the way of doing this is uh, uh, we will create a small cr cluster with two HA, HA uh, proxies. Um, they will be running the same configuration uh, and they will be running in an active standby uh, configuration. So only one of them will be active, accepting uh, connections and, and doing uh, the, uh, the work, and the other one was, will be just in a standby waiting to take over if the active server um, gets problems. And the way of doing this uh, are we use a, a little piece of software called uh, Keep Alive. Uh, we have to install Keep Alive in both servers, and we have to configure to uh, check if 
HA proxy uh, is working properly locally and to check if the HA proxy server is uh, there and working properly. Um, and what will be happening is that if the HA proxy process uh, dies or um, gets in trouble, or the HA proxy uh, server that is active uh, goes down, uh, Keep Alive will find out that, and we will talk, they would, we would talk with the standby server. The standby server will get the VIP address installed there by Keep Alive and it will, promote, will be promoted to, to be the active um, load balancer in our cluster. And when the, the server that went down or had problems came up um, and started working properly, uh, what will happen is that it will be targeted as uh, the new standby server in our uh, cluster, small cluster. It works really good. Um, uh, we, I mean, it's so stable that we, have, we haven't had problems with it for for years, actually. And have you considered using any cast or BGP? Any? Like any cast? No. And that's because we want to, to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. You can do a lot of things. I mean, this is a very simple um, cluster solution from for for an HP uh, HA proxy. Uh, but I mean, you have to have it in the in the same uh, network. You know, you, you cannot have one proxy in one network and the other one in other lo location because it will. You know, you have to use other techniques to to have that kind of load balancing system. But uh, usually, an ELK uh, system will be in your infrastructure, in your network. You know, uh, it it will be in a way an internal system that only your infrastructure has access to. So. It, it works really good because of that. In practice, are the input and output uh, mixed the same, same network interface, or are, are they actually separate physical interfaces when you're setting this up? Uh, I didn't understand the... In, in practice, your input interface and your output interface, are they separate physical interfaces? The Logstash uh, part? HA proxy. So at the, top and the top and bottom interfaces. That one and that one? Are no, yeah, or you can you can use you can use the same interface, uh, but usually it's better if the VIP address and the and the and the address for the HTTP proxy are in the same network. So the way of implementing this uh, is uh, you have to configure uh, Keep Alive. Uh, very easy to, con to configure uh, if you know how to do it. Um, We'll use several hours to find out that little piece of uh, configuration uh, because um, the documentation was not that clear uh, to us. And the problem we had was what with the uh, IPv4, uh, IPv4 and 6 uh, in our system. We are running both and uh, uh, we, we were having problems moving these VIPs from one server to the other one, uh, uh, you know. But we found out how to do it. Uh, and you have, what we have here is uh, you have three sections. You have the global section just to, to, where you can define some global parameters. You have the script section where you can define how you are going to check for the HA proxy process, uh, if it's working or not. And you have the uh, instance section where will you define um, some of the, uh, the, the VIPs that will be uh, moving from one server to the other one when you are in a, in a failed situation. Um, so the only thing you have to do, you install this uh, Keep Alive uh, process in your system. You start the two Keep Alive and the two HA proxy in the, in the, in the, in the servers. And uh, Keep Alive will find out which of the servers uh, will be the active one in the, in the cluster. And that's all. Um, so, now we are here. We have a system that, we're, uh, some, uh, that we can use to, to, um, to receive data for, uh, from all our uh, devices. Uh, you have uh, full redundancy um, in the receiver part. 
uh, you have full redundancy in the processor part. You can scale that. If you need more resources, you just have to have uh, several servers in, in of the different types. Uh, and you have um, full redundancy in the HHA H -H proxy uh, part of the, of the, of the system. Uh, yes? That, yes, we use that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, in the, you know, if you remember the, the slide about the workers in the pip pipeline, we use that persistent, uh, that's that, that queue where all the data coming in, in the, from the uh, input block will be safe in that queue, and we use persistent. So if something happens, you won't lose the data, for, because the data in that queue doesn't disappear until the worker acknowledge that the, um, the, the data have been uh, processed and delivered uh, properly. So, so it, 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 again, it works really good. It uh, almost like the RabbitMQ. Um, you, you have those mechani mechanisms there that control um, the data coming out and in and, and who is doing it, and it works really good. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about is the uh, protected, I mean, the security. You need security around all this uh, system. Um, you, will, you should have, uh, uh, you should protect that, uh, the, the network uh, running this, uh, where these servers are running uh, with some kind of a, um, um, a firewall or IP tables or, you know, depending on uh, the system you are using for that and you should allow all the devices uh, delivering data in, into your system should be allowed to talk only with the VIP address in your HG proxy. They should not be allowed to talk with the rest of the system. And then you have full control of the entrance points into your ERC system. Um, so, uh, how, this is how the data flow uh, of a log coming into the ELK uh, uh, looks out. Uh, you have the agents uh, in, in the clients and servers sending data into the, into the uh, uh, VIP address and then to the receiver part, um, RabbitMQ, the processor, and then save it in the Elasticsearch. As, I, um, as you can see, you have different queues all over uh, the system. And this is only for that pipeline and that pipeline and that. But you have several servers here. You have several servers and pipelines here. So you have a lot of queues all over your system. And this uh, makes um, the system very resilient and elastic. Uh, if something happens in the processor part, uh, you will, the queues here will absorb uh, the data coming in until the processor uh, uh, service start working again, and this, you know, the same if the, you have problems with Rabbit and Q, you will uh, queue up here. So it's really, it's really elastic and really um, resilient. Uh, it works really good. So what is really uh, important to do here is to monitor all these queues because they will give you a hint on how the system is working. Uh, as long as the queues are empty or almost empty, the system will be working good. Uh, if some of the queues start uh, growing, that's uh, a sign that something is happening somewhere in the system. So, uh, some stats. Uh, this is what we are getting in our system uh, with that, uh, with that uh, implementation that I have uh, explained. We have to two load balancers, four receivers, four processors, two RabbitMQs. Uh, we have around 34 uh, processor pipelines. Uh, and two receiver pipelines. And of course, uh, 34 uh, message queues, LQs in, in RabbitMQ, one for every single processor pipeline. Uh, we, have, we are having around between 12 and 30,000 uh, TCP connections to, to the HE proxy and between two and 4,000 bits connections uh, to the system. So in total, we are, we are around, normally around 15. 16,000 connections, uh, active connections uh, at all times. What's, uh, the, what's the hypervisor? The hypervisor, what's it running on? Uh, um, all these uh, uh, servers are virtual, 
and they are running in a VMware uh, cluster. Um, and you can see the capacity too that we are using, so we have quite uh, a lot uh, available. Um, we are normally with between 9,000 and 20,000 uh, uh, metrics or logs uh, are being processed all the time. Uh, we have, with this system, we have around 50, 60,000 is the top. We, we don't get more uh, than that. Uh, and we, don't, we really don't need it. So uh, we haven't checked or tested if uh, having more, most probably is the processor, uh, processor part of the system. With more processor um, uh, service, we will, we will um, um, get much more throughput through, uh, in the system. Um, yeah. So now to the data storage part of the system, and that's Elastic. Um, as you know, Elastic is the part of the Elk uh, stack that um, uh, can be used to, to save uh, and storage your data. Uh, it's a distributed, uh, distributed search engine that can be used uh, to, to uh, index and to uh, search and retrieved that uh, data, uh, huge amounts of data, uh, very fast. It's writing in, uh, in Java, and our system looks something like that. Um, we have, uh, this is the H proxy we have been talking about uh, in our previous uh, section, and these are the two coordinator uh, servers that we have in the, in the cluster. Um, all the data coming in and out into the Elasticsearch uh, cluster go through those two servers. Uh, and we have redundancy and enough uh, capacity so we can take them down for maintenance and, and the system will continue working without problems. Then we have a set of uh, nodes that we call hot nodes with uh, fast uh, S, uh, SSD uh, disks and we use those um, nodes to index all the data coming into the, uh, into the system. We have around three weeks with data in those nodes, and after three weeks, uh, we move all the data to the, what we call, call uh, data nodes. Uh, that are nodes with uh, um, normal disks, um, and, you know, and you use them more to, for all data. Uh, that is not uh, uh, needed um, uh, all the time. Uh, we have uh, many um, um, cold data nodes uh, because, uh, as I say in the beginning, we have to have uh, data for three, six, and in some cases more time, save it and uh, accessible. Uh, we have three. We have three uh, master uh, nodes in the in the in the clusters, in the cluster, and we have a dedicated uh, ten gigabit. Um, uh, network between all these nodes. Um, you don't use all the capacity in that uh, network except when you have to move data or with when one of the uh, nodes goes down or you have a problem and then you start moving data between them, then you start using uh, the capacity. In a normal situation with uh, all the nodes up uh, and just normal uh, data coming into the system, you don't use, uh, I mean, one-tenth of the capacity maybe. Yeah. Um, we don't have ingest uh, nodes and we don't have machine learning nodes in our cluster because we don't have the money to pay uh, for a license that allow us to do, to do that. Uh, we are doing some machine, uh, machine learning with the data there, but it's not through the Elasticsearch uh, um, um, infrastructure. It's the, you know, you just, we just get out data from from Elk, and we process it in another system for some machine learning. What do you use for that? Oh, software. I don't know because uh, this. Uh, I don't know, but I can find out because it's another another uh, group team working with that. But I can I can find out. Yeah. That's some elastic um, some information about the hardware we use in Elastic. Um, we are not going to use so much time uh, with this. Um, you can go in and see if if you if you like. But uh, 
the most important thing um, to take off, off when, uh, when you are configuring uh, an Elasticsearch cluster is memory. Memory and garbage collection. Um, if you don't have enough CPU or I.O. In your, in your system, things will run slower, uh, but most probably will be stable and with no crash. If you have problems with your memory or garbage collection, the whole cluster um, will be in hell. And we have been there uh, several times. Um, so uh, if you go in a situation where you, uh, you are using uh, all the memory you have in the cluster and the garbage collection uh, start um, doing uh, its job, um, you will have a lot of process indexes, uh, all the processes uh, indexing and searching uh, will halt for a long time and you will, it's, an, it's not a nice situation. So almost uh, all the work we have done with Elastic is just in the memory management part, you know, because usually it works really good with, with the default parameters. Uh, and of course, it's Java. Um, the, the version of Java we are using uh, right now uh, has over 800 configuration parameters and over 70 of them are only for uh, configuring garbage collection, uh, the, the garbage collector. So uh, you have to be uh, really advanced and expert in Java to, to be able to, to get something out of that. Uh, we are not, um, so we keep uh, things simple. And what we have done is the very simple uh, um, adjustments in, the, in how Java is, uh, is used in memory. Uh, we, we define uh, the max heap use it, uh, that can be used by Elastic, and we use the max uh, that can be used by Java. Um, you, cannot, you should not use more than 32 gigabytes uh, because according to the documentation, things will start working uh, much slower than if you have less uh, heap size uh, allocated. So what we do is we, we allocate as much as we can, and that's the 31 gigs uh, uh, we have per server. And then um, we have found out that uh, um, garbage collection, um, it really depends what kind of node you are in, if you are in the hot or in the, in the call, in the client or in the masters, you know. Um, and it's really important to define the amount um, of um, uh, young and old memory pool in the heap. Uh, because uh, uh, that's where the garbage collection will start um, um, sending uh, data between those two pools and, and deleting uh, all data from there and so on. So we have found a, a spot, sweet spot, that works really good for us and the amount of data we have. Uh, and what we do is that we use around 42% uh, and 58 for all for the hot uh, data nodes. In the calls, we have 25-75%, uh, and in the master's coordinators, we have 33 and 66. Um, and these have to be defined, because uh, per default, even if the documentation, Java documentation says, says so, those, uh, if you don't, don't define uh, those parameters in the uh, GVM uh, options um, file, the Java virtual, uh, the Java, uh, engine won't define those, uh, those parameters properly. I don't know why, but we found out uh, that um, after uh, yeah, the, the last time we have uh, big problems with memory in Elastic. And another thing is in the, in the Elastic search uh, configuration file, that's our, the, those are the parameters we use to, to control a little the, the uh, memory and the garbage collection. So we just have increased a little the, the buffer used for indexing. Uh, we don't allow swap uh, of the um, memory used by HIP, and we uh, limit uh, how much memory you can use uh, when defining some, some, um, some search in the system so you don't go over, over the limit. Uh, as you know, the index, the, the way you, you, you save things in uh, in uh, Elastic are indexes. Indexes uh, are split or uh, in several parts that they call charts. 
And uh, it's really important to know how many charts you should have per, per index because then the number of charts in your system will affect how much memory you use in the system. Uh, so we have found out is that the indexes under 50 gigs should have uh, two charts, one, one replica. Between 100 and 600, we have the size of the index uh, divided by 50 uh, with one plus one replica and indexes that are between 600 and one tera. Uh, we divide the size by 80. Uh, plus one replica. So we, we, what we want to do with this is to, to keep the shard size between 50 and 80 gigs so they don't get uh, too big. Uh, the way we are organizing the, um, our indexes uh, looks like that, and we use heavily that part there where we define aliases for our indexes, and we do that to give access to uh, several uh, user uh, groups or logonios as we call it to the different um, uh, indexes in the in the system and we do that by defining uh, an uh, Elasticsearch uh, template for the index uh, where you define um, the aliases uh, using a filter or a search in this way in this example for example in this example, we have the index name uh, is the one, the index we have created uh, in our example for log owner one, uh, for my application, and for that week of that uh, year. But we can define uh, uh, log owner two, my application, as an alias to that index, and that will give access to that log owner two to all the logs in that index that has a log owner like log owner two, if that makes uh, some sense. Um, and we do that because we, we want to keep that the, the, the number of uh, indexes as low as possible because again, if you have an index needs more memory because you have to manage that index, all the shards and so on, so on, so on. So this is a way of having um, the data only one place and have uh, the possibility of give access to it um, yeah, to different uh, user groups. These are some of the stats for the Elasticsearch uh, cluster we have. Um, number of indexes, uh, 1,477. Number of docs there uh, or blocks in, in the system is around 60 billions. You say that in English? Yeah, 60 billions. Yeah, 60 billions. Uh, logs. Uh, we use around um, between 85 and 95 uh, uh, terabytes of data. We're using only the 50% of the capacity uh, right now. Um, and you know, and the number of uh, Elasticsearch connections from uh, the Logstash processor pipelines on uh, clients, uh, Kibana uh, instances accessing the, uh, the, the system is between 280 and 477. So you have, you know, um, um, it works really good. Uh, you can see what you can get with the, with the, with the system we have. So this is how the uh, um, system will look when you have the receiver, the processor, and the storage part uh, in place. Uh, and again, you have to, to protect all these networks. Uh, uh, especially the Elasticsearch cluster should, should be in a dedicated um, network uh, with uh, no access at all, only through uh, that HA proxy. Um, so you have control of what is going in and out of the system. Um, for the data search and access, we are using Kibana. Um, again, we, don't have, we are not paying for the license because we don't have the money. Uh, so Kibana, without uh, the extra functionality, it's just uh, it doesn't have any authentication or authorization. So we are using NX, um, uh, a proxy, um, NNX, in front uh, of Kibana and between Kibana and Elastic. I'm going to say a few words about that right now. And we are running Kibana in a Kubernetes uh, um, uh, cluster running 
in OpenShift. The way we give access to all this uh, information that we have collect, process, and, and, uh, um, and save in Elasticsearch um, is bit, uh, with this system. Um, what we have is a Kibana instance per log owner. Uh, one Kibana instance for a log owner will have uh, NUNX proxy in front of it, uh, where we uh, uh, we used to uh, authenticate uh, the user going into that instance. That uh, NUNX uh, proxy will be connected to our LDAP uh, system for, to, to, to give us uh, the authentication um, and data we need. Uh, and then we have uh, NUNX um, proxy between the Kibana uh, container and the uh, Elasticsearch uh, cluster. And that uh, NUNX uh, um, uh, container will uh, filter what the Kibana instance can do. And we give only access to uh, the indexes and aliases that are prefixed with the same name as the log owner from that uh, instance. So in that way, uh, users, uh, um, logging in in that instance will have access only to the indexes that start with the same uh, name of the log owner, um, log owner's name. Um, and of course, we have uh, SSL termination and base routing uh, on top of these uh, uh, NUNOC um, uh, proxies that we use for authentication. And um, it's the OpenShift and Kubernetes that, that, that I think they use HA proxy to, to do that. So, that was all. <laughs> Any questions? We are, um, the group where I'm working, we, we are working with uh, data collection, with monitoring, uh, trending, and, uh, and automation. And we are around five, six people. Yeah. It's not only this, we have uh, more, you know, but this all, everything has to do with, uh, with data. Um, No. There is a lot of work uh, going on with uh, with the uh, Open Tristro, uh distribution, yeah. and I'm sure they will come with. Okay. Yeah. Uh, under the wire goes, is it, that also includes uh, security? It does, you, yes, it does, but uh, um, not a lap <laughs> or uh, 80. So, yeah. Did you play around with open distro? Uh, we have, um, we have doing it now, but we, we started just a few weeks ago. Sure. So we are, we are checking there and um, we have to see how it works and if it's easy to maintain, that's really important in, in a system like this. You have a lot of components and you want to do it as standard as possible. You don't want to do a lot of uh, um, tuning, tuning and, you know. We, we use um, search guard. You might be able to use that to advance the There? Okay. Yeah, 
Uh, it was, it was uh, a, a Right. <laughs> it was a surpri the price we got. I mean, we have tried several times, uh, but the, the price we uh, we got all the times we tried to, to talk with Elastic, uh, even with the discount we get for being a university, it, the price was so it was so expensive that I mean I cannot imagine how much uh, people in the in the private sector are paying are paying for for to, to use this. Um, and it's not that we don't have, we don't want to, to, to pay, it's that we don't have the, the money. Even if we want, we don't have it. And so, yeah, but well, that's uh, the way they do business. And so your authentication user interface, is it, uh, does it actually present a web page that you log into, or is it sort of the yeah. TTP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just a very easy um, uh, page where you can, you can, um, uh, write uh, the username and uh, username and, and password, and it would, it will, um, yeah, there, and then and the the um, the container will connect to LDAP just to check if it's okay. So it's very uh, again very simple, and um, simple things usually are robust, and um, you know, and you don't have uh, a lot of things that can can go wrong. And especially with, because security is, is an issue here too. We have a lot of information there that uh, uh, not everybody can access. Uh, only the security team has access to all the information we have in the system. And then when you have that type of access is when, when you can correlate between all these uh, sources of information, you can do magic. They do magic with that uh, information. But not everybody has, it's allowed to do that because you know we have regulations and we have laws and yeah. Um, I was just gonna ask if you had what sort of retention policies for any different indexes or is it just you, you've got X amount of storage and No, we have we have retention policies and depending on the type, the type of data those indexes are, are um, has. You know, we have to define the retention policy. Um, what we use for that is Curator. Um, I know that the, the last um, um, Elk version has this functionality available in Kibana. Uh, we have not tried that because we have been using Curator for a long time and it works really good. Curator is just a, a software that you can use to move uh, data between nodes and to you can do a lot of things with that um, amongst, you know, you, have, you can have some retention, retention times and uh, delete automatically all the indexes depending on the retention time you have for that type of index. Is it how you move from off call? Yes. All those, uh, um, the, the cold and hot um, uh, servers, um, they have a tag that defines if it's a hot or a cold server. <clears throat> and what you say to curator is say, okay, if this index is older than three weeks, move it to a node that is half the call tag and, and it will do it automatically and, you know, really good. Are you running <coughs> no replicas on your cold storage? Yes, one replica every, uh, everywhere. Uh, even on cold? Yeah. <coughs> then why RAID 5? Why? It's easy to replace a, a disk, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, it's just a matter of uh, for how long you will have uh, the server down. Um, and with, if you're using RAID 5, you just uh, change the, the disk and, the, and you, know, you don't have, um, you don't have um, downtime for that server. Um, but the replica is more than, um, if you take down one server for, uh, well, it really depends on the number of, of nodes you have. But it's nice to have one replica, uh, at least one replica. Uh, so you, you can have several servers that go down without, without the, the system uh, having problems with that. Um, in addition to the replica, we have, we have uh, a snapshot. So you, you just move data out of the, of the system. Um, and again, it's because you, um, the security aspect. Uh, 
the, that data by law has to be there so we cannot lose it. And, and that's the only reason why we do it that, that way. Okay, thank you very much.